book me up. Usually people fall asleep after I start preaching, but I find it good to wake people up on the front end. Well, today we're going to be talking about time. As we continue our series on Won't You Be My Neighbor, it's Christ and our calendars. And it was it's kind of what was scheduled for, for this week of uh, messages. But I realized as I was preparing for this that, you know, looking online and doing research, that time management is actually big business these days. There are a lot of studies about how we use our time and how we feel about time. And um, uh, I just saw a study recently, just in the last week, it was reported on that showed for those who are working that, that every hour you spend working over 40 hours, uh, your productivity actually goes down with each additional hour, that the longer you work, you're not actually getting that much more work done, which is convicting for someone like me, and I guess full disclosure, I would say about 110% of this sermon uh, I'm preaching for myself uh, because I'm much more apt to work 60 hours than 40 hours, and that's not always a good thing. In fact, it is never a good thing. But there are consultants that help us with time management. They make a good living helping others work on their own time management. There are programs. There are products. There's even phone apps that help us manage our calendars, manage our time, make more efficient use of it, make it more productive. And there was an article I saved a few years back. It was in The Economist magazine, and it was about busyness, that everybody feels so busy. And this is how that article began. The predictions sounded like promises. In the future, working hours would be short and vacations would be long. Our grandchildren reckoned John Maynard Keynes in 1930 would work around three hours a day. That's three hours a day. That's, that's the work day for people of the future, they thought, 1930. And those three hours a day would really just be our choice because we didn't have really anything else to do, so we thought we'd work three hours. Economic progress and technological advances had already shrunk working hours considerably by his day, John Maynard Keynes' day. There was no reason to believe this trend would not continue. Whizzy cars, ever more time-saving tools, appliances, guaranteed more speed, less drudgery in all parts of life. This was, was a widely held thought, they noted in this article, that during that same period, social scientists began to fret, what in the world would we do with all of this free time? They worried about our society and what we could do with all this extra time we find ourselves with. We just, well, they noted, as it's turned out, having too much time on our hands is not one of the world's most pressing problems. Everyone everywhere seems to be busy. In the corporate world, there is a, quote, perennial time scarcity problem that afflicts executives all over the globe, and the matter has only grown more acute in recent years. The amount of reports of anxiety and depression and all of the health-related issues of being overstressed and overworked and overanxious. And these feelings are particularly profound among working parents. All of those time-saving gizmos, many people grumble that these Bits of wizardry chew up far too much of our days. Whether we're sitting in traffic for hours on end or navigating those robotic voice messaging systems or scything away at our emails, sometimes all three at the same time. And it is true. We have more time-saving technology, technological conveniences today than we've ever had in history. And yet we feel like we never have time for anything. That seems to be the message in almost every single one of these articles and reports. They seem like they come out every single week. We just don't have time. We have machines that wash our clothes and our dishes, vehicles that transport us from place to place, computers to auto-schedule our bill plays, and now you can call up your groceries or order them online, and they'll bring them out to your car when you pull up at Walmart. And yet with all this time saved, we seem to have less of it for all the things that really matter. And those who study business, busyness more scientifically, this article goes on to tell us, when they study it, they realize that it's not that we don't have more time than we've ever had before, it's just that our perception of time, how we view time, how we understand it, has changed. 
we actually work 12 hours less per week than workers did 40 years ago. Time spent on household tasks has dropped even more dramatically. The article concludes towards the end that the problem then is less how much time people have, but how they see it. Ever since a clock was first used to synchronize labor in the 18th century, time has been understood in relation to money. Once hours are financially quantified, people worry more about wasting time or saving time or investing time or using time profitably. We almost always use economic language when it comes to time. And they even noted in that article that, that the more successful you are and the more wealthy you become, the more you value time. And anything that's more valuable thus becomes more scarce. It's like we have completely changed what time used to be about. Because I think it's exactly right that when we say our challenges with time are a perception problem, when we think of our day, our time as a commodity, like Ben Franklin, I think, was the first to say time is money. And we think about it in those terms, and then we lament that there's just not enough hours in the day to get everything done. Then we do have a perception problem. Genesis 1 tells us that God created the heavens and the earth. God created light and there was light. And remember, a day or so later, God was creating the sun and the stars in this this beautiful, beautiful beginning to our scriptures. And he set the sun to rule the day and the stars to rule the night. There was morning, there was evening. God established, God created time itself, the daylight and the dark 24 hours in a day, natural rhythms of light and darkness, seven days a week. And if we believe that God is the creator of the universe, that God is the creator of time itself, then the time that we have each day and each moment is a gift. It's not a commodity. Time isn't money, but time is actually far more precious. Of course, why does all of this matter? I think it matters because I don't think we can love the Lord our God with all our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength, and love our neighbors as ourselves if it's our perception that there's just not enough time. There's just not enough time in the day for all of that because if we see it as God's creation, then there will always be enough time. Way back in week one, we looked at the story of the Good Samaritan. And we remember in that story, we had the man who was beaten and robbed and left to die by the side of the road. And we had a priest who came by and saw him and passed by on the other side without stopping to help. And then we had the Levite, another religious layperson, religious professional, again, saw him, but didn't stop, passed over on the other side. And as we talk about that passage of scripture, we almost always talk about the priest and the Levite and all the reasons they probably didn't stop because it would make them unclean to, to get involved uh, for, for religious reasons or for whatever uh, reasons why they didn't have compassion that they needed to have. And as I prepared for, for this Sunday, it occurred to me that if we were to tell that parable today, probably the, the biggest reason they wouldn't have stopped to help is because they would have said they didn't have the time. Because they realized to get involved in this situation, I'm going to have to stop my day. I'm going to have to set aside all the other things I was planning to do, and I'm going to have to attend to this person maybe for much longer than I had planned. And so we pass on to the other side. It's not that we don't feel sorry for them, wish we could help. We just don't have the time. Well, Jesus always seemed to have the time. He turned the world upside down in only three years. He moved from place to place on foot. He wasn't able to get anywhere in a hurry, and yet look at all that Jesus was able to do. Jesus was busy. You see that in the Gospels as you see him go from place to place and from encounter to encounter, but Jesus never seemed to be in a hurry. Jesus operated out of a sense of urgency, but he never seemed to be rushed. He had a task to accomplish, but he always seemed to put others first. He was always present and available, but never in one of those ways where it's unhealthy, some kind of unhealthy obligation. And others around Jesus didn't always understand. 
Sometimes when there would be crowds, Jesus knew that he needed to set aside time for prayer, and so he would go out in the wilderness to pray by himself, not to be pressured or pushed with the time he was devoting to God. There was another time when uh, there was big crowds around and the disciples were keeping the kids away. Jesus doesn't have time for those kids. And he said, no, let the children come to me and don't hinder them. For to such belong the kingdom of God. There was another episode where there was the, the blind man, blind Bartimaeus, on the side of the road when Jesus was passing by, again with large crowds, and he cried out to Jesus, Jesus, son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the others in the crowd told him to be quiet. Don't bother Jesus. He's too important. He's too busy for the likes of you. But Jesus stopped. And he engaged this poor blind man and healed him. For Jesus, there was always enough time. Jesus understood his mission and his purpose. He used his time towards that end. He wasn't a slave to time. He never saved time. He never wasted time. He never spent it or invested it. He just used what was given to him to accomplish the priorities that God had placed in his life. Time was a gift from God. Last week, Mike, you shared about your financial stewardship. The big, if you were here last week and heard his testimony, he shared about financially where he had all of these obligations. You had to pay the mortgage, you had your weekly expenses, you had to save for the kid's college fund, you had to save for retirement, but promised to give to God whatever was left over. And realizing that that's the wrong thing, the way to think about stewardship, that we don't give God what's left over, we give God the first fruits. We make it the priority, and somehow when we do that, it's amazing how the other things in our life fall into their proper place. Well, time... Time is a gift no less than the money that we have. Time, we are called to be stewards of that gift. And I think we far too often make the same mistakes with how we think about our day and the time that we have that we do with our finances. We have so many things that we have to take care of. Families, sometimes the appointments, sometimes just all of the work that we have before us. And we feel sometimes like we're stretched thin and we just don't have the energy anymore and we end up just giving God whatever time we have left over. As if the time belonged to us to begin with. As you think about your day and your schedule, what priorities are revealed by how you spend your day? I mean, you might tell somebody what the priorities of your life are, but would your daily schedule actually back you up on that? Do you devote yourself to the things that you truly do think are most important in your own life? Or are you just sort of swept along by whatever seems most urgent next? I think we do need to change our perception of time. And there's actually some ways that we can do that as people of faith. The first thing that we can do is actually what you're doing right now, which is to set aside time each week for Sabbath, to give back to God part of what God has given you. God has given you seven days in the week, and one of those days, God has asked us to give back. And so coming and being present in worship, coming with humility and gratitude for all of the blessings, come and put yourself in right relationship with God. I was referring to Genesis 1 earlier that, that God did create the day in six, in six days and on the seventh day he rested. If you read at the end of each day, God said it was good. God did this and said it was good. God created light, it was good. God created the wa- separated the waters, it was good. All of this was good. He got to humans and he said it was very good. When he got to the Sabbath day, he didn't say it was good. When he got to the seventh day and he rested, God called it holy. It was the one day of the week that was holy. So important was it, it made its way into the Ten Ten Commandments, honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so here you are today, well done, to set aside this time, to put ourselves in right relationship with God. I think the second thing that we can do to help change our perception of time is to make sure we have our priorities right, to make sure that we're not overcome and overwhelmed but are able to keep things in the right perspective. 
Every time I feel overwhelmed, I almost always go back to Matthew 6. It's the passage of scripture that's listed in your bulletin for this message. It's that end of chapter 6, verses 24 to 35, I believe, where Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount is telling us not to worry. Therefore, I say to you, don't worry about your life. What you'll eat or what you'll drink or about your body and what you'll wear isn't life more than food and the body more than clothes. Look at the birds of the sky. They don't sow seed or harvest grain or gather crops into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth much more than they are? Who among you, by worrying, can add a single moment to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? Notice how the lilies in the field grow. They don't wear themselves out with work, and they don't spin cloth. But I say to you, even Solomon in all of his splendor wasn't dressed like one of these. If God dresses the grass of the field so beautifully, even though it's alive today and tomorrow, it's thrown into the furnace, won't God do much more for you, you people of weak faith? Therefore, don't worry and say, what are we going to eat and what are we going to drink and what are we going to wear? Instead, desire first and foremost God's kingdom and God's righteousness and all of these things will be given to you as well. Just like we've been given six days to work, and we work hard, and given that seventh day to rest and give thanks. So even in the midst of all of our hard work, we work without anxiety. We work without worry. If we as Christians learn the humility of seeing time as a gift from God, if we as Christians work hard but then honor the Sabbath day and keep it holy with rest and celebration and with gratitude if we as Christians find that peace that passes all understanding and quit reflecting the anxiety and the angst and the manic need for more and bigger and better that we see in our culture, if we can become those kind of people, that would be the strongest public witness I can think of to our faith. Because we profess our belief in Jesus Christ, our Lord, but what difference does it make? Can I see it in your life? And let me tell you, nothing speaks louder than what we do with our time and what we do with our money. Jesus changes us all the way to the very everyday decisions that we make. Does Jesus make that difference in your own life? And I think the third thing we can do to change our perception is remember that Christ has promised to be with us always, even until the end of the age. That each and every moment, each and every day is holy because God's presence is with us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we set aside the time for worship and for Sabbath, but I think that's just to teach us how to see God in all the other days of our life. One of my favorite passages from a a Christian writer, a, a, a Christian pastor and novelist named Frederick Buechner, was one of the the best spiritual writers of of the last century, the 1900s. He said, I discovered, and this was him summarizing what he he thought his message was as as a Christian writer. He said this, I discovered that if you really keep your eye peeled to it and your ears open, if you really pay attention to it, even such a limited and limiting life as the one I was living opened up onto extraordinary vistas taking your children to school, kissing your wife goodbye, eating lunch with a friend, trying to do a decent day's work and hearing the rain patter against the window. There is no event so commonplace, but the God is present within it, always hiddenly, always leaving you room to recognize him or not to recognize him, but all the more fascinatingly because of that, all the more compellingly and hauntingly. He concludes that passage by saying, if I was called upon to state in a few words the essence of everything I was trying to say, both as a novelist and as a preacher, it would be something like this. Listen to your life. See it for the fathomless mystery that it is, and the boredom and the pain of it no less than the excitement and the gladness. Touch, taste, and smell your way to the holy and hidden heart of it, because in the end, all moments are key moments. Life itself is grace. One of the ways we can change our perception of time is to think about what's in the day ahead of us. What are we doing tomorrow? Think about what's on our calendars. And then try this practice. Pray it. 
Sit down for a couple of minutes and look at your schedule. Think about the people that you will meet and interact with. If you're still working, think of who you work for or the people who work for you or your peers. Think of the people who will check you out at the grocery store or the people who will check you in for your appointment. Think of the people that you'll talk to on the phone, those you'll meet on the streets, those you'll text, or those you'll talk to, people you'll email. Think about each task you have to do, the chores around the house, the errands around town. If you're like me, the endless to-do list that seems to take up, it takes me longer to make my to-do list sometimes than to actually do the things on the to-do list, all of it. There's no event so commonplace but that God is not present within it. And we can recognize it or we cannot. But it's when we change our perception that we begin to see how life itself truly is grace. Time is a gift from God and there is always enough. Time for things that matter. Time to stop and help. Time to stop and talk. Time to stop and pray. Time to honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Time to love God and time to love our neighbors. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.